Look, you can just save yourself quoting George Carlin's happens to be yay and openly bits at me. I know them. So here we go again, doing sort of my monthly talking about LGBTQ plus representation in media. So firstly, we can swap the look out. Now, I've actually had a few people comment on the fact that I do this, like in a disparaging way, not that they think I look bad, but like some people have said that they, they don't like that I have to do this. Like they think I, I'm doing it to fulfill some obligation. Like I'm not gonna be listened to if I don't do this. I don't think that's, necessarily the case but the reason i present this way when i talk about these topics is this is the headspace that i'm coming from when i talk about this it's it's fairly relevant to my point of view and honestly i am more comfortable presenting like this when i talk about these sorts of things so um yeah this is what it's going to be so with that having been said this time i want to talk about the funny kind of balancing act that goes on when trying to present a greater number of LGBTQ plus characters in mainstream entertainment. In this case, I, I want to be clear, by mainstream I mean things like major film franchises, prominent comic book titles, well-watched TV shows, and in general, things intended to attract as many consumers as possible. I'm not talking about niche work targeted specifically at an LGBTQ plus audience. Because something that comes up rather often in the comments sections of videos where I talk about these sorts of things is a plea to not have characters be defined by their sexuality or gender identity. And what people should be doing is to just write an LGBTQ plus character the same as you would any other character and have them, quote, just happen to be gay. Now, before I dig into this, I, I do want to say up front, there isn't anything inherently wrong with this mentality as an approach. But I often see it presented as if it's the ideal way, if not the only way to, quote, do it right. And I do feel there's a problem with that particular outlook. Now, I've talked about how films, TV, or comics have they have to, in some way, by dialogue or character action, confirm that a character is in fact LGBTQ+, because otherwise audiences won't know. They may suspect, but it's hard to be sure. There are very few easily identified visual signifiers of LGBTQ+, unless we're dealing in cliches and stereotypes, and it, you know, unless you're doing that, it does need to be pointed out at least once. So let's take it as a given for the time being and assume that happens to be gay as an approach isn't a matter of never referencing, but rather of referencing it only to confirm it, most likely in passing and otherwise not bringing it up. And as I said, there is value in this. It contributes to the process of normalization where LGBTQ plus people become demystified. That air of, I don't know what these people are like, gets dispersed by having them in media representations just present and come across as being no different from anybody else. To quote author Patricia Highsmith, the only difference between us and heterosexuals is what we do in bed. Except I don't actually believe that to be true. Not for all of us. For some LGBTQ plus people, their status as such is one of the major defining factors in the directions their lives have taken. And I mean that well beyond who they choose to have their relationships with. Many have to deal with being ostracized, go through periods of deep personal confusion, and a lot of other experiences that simply would not have been part of their lives had they been cisgender and heterosexual and never questioned those elements of themselves. And to hardline the message that LGBTQ plus people are the same as cisgender hetero people, while well-meaning, disregards the reality of life for many LGBTQ plus members. Of course, 
In some ways, the pushing of the happens to be gay model of representation is also an attempt to counteract what is believed and perceived to be a defined by sexuality or gender identity issue that folks tend to bring up often in the comments. And when people complain that a character is, quote, defined by their queerness, what they generally actually mean is that everything about that character appears to tie back into this singular fact, the way they behave, the way they dress, what they talk about, etc. It overwhelmingly appears to be informed by whatever is perceived to be the queer way to do those things or is otherwise pushed through a queer lens. Now, I don't generally like to make comparisons between LGBTQ plus people and the experience of non-white people and, and their experiences, but in this case, I am going to do that in order to illustrate something and get to a point as clearly and succinctly as I can. Now, I'm about to make some pretty broad generalizations about the trends in media uh, and the entertainment industry over the past few decades, but as broad as I'm being, I hope it'll serve as a common frame of reference. Now, the term black exploitation is generally used to refer to a period in the 1970s with a wave of films such as Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, Shaft, Cleopatra Jones, also TV shows like The Jeffersons, Good Times, characters like Huggy Bear on Starsky and Hutch. There were books. It, it was all over the place. So there was a marked increase in the visibility of black characters in the 70s. However, it could also be said that they were there in order to be as black as possible. They were defined by their blackness, blackness as defined by the pop culture stereotyping of the time. The result is that, yes, there were more black people on screen, but they were pimps and hustlers. They talked jive and lived in bad neighborhoods. Now, in the 80s, there was a pushback to that. Not to say that it went away entirely, but rather that a counter-narrative began to take shape. And that took the form of characters who were black, but could have been portrayed by white actors with little to no changes being made to the characterization or the story. You know, they happen to be black. This would include characters like Sergeant Murtaugh from Lethal Weapon, Tubbs on Miami Vice, Louis Gossett Jr.'s Drill Sergeant character, and an officer and a gentleman. Heck, it's practically the entire conceptual premise of The Cosby Show, which I know is something we don't really like to talk about anymore, but it's kind of central to where I'm going with this, so apologies. Now on that show, accepting occasional anecdotes from Bill or an older character, there was very little directly referencing how being black affected the family's lives. I mean, the show ultimately wasn't dissimilar from fairly standard sitcoms of the era in terms of premise and characters. They just happened to be black. However, this then led to a new counter-narrative, which was spurred on by black artists and creators who looked at mass entertainment, things like The Cosby Show, saw more people that looked like them, but those people were not showing lives that were reflective of their own life experiences as black people. And I think this is a big part of the reason that in the 90s, hip hop began to truly dominate. And around that same time, you saw things like the films of Spike Lee really take hold, gangster culture in general. And again, to reference a prominent sitcom, contrast Fresh Prince of Bel-Air with The Cosby Show. I mean, Fresh Prince seemed almost to be born from the conceptual seed of what if we put a real black person in the middle of the Cosby house and see what happens? My point in illustrating all this is that the happens to be black period of the 80s had value, but it also undermined and papered over harsh truths that were very real for many black people and remain so. So to bring it back to LGBTQ plus I would actually argue we've already had an exploitation period, at least as far as gay men specifically are concerned. Um, other members of the community, it's, it's a little later, but saying it with, with gay men. Now, the 2000s saw an eruption of things like Will and Grace, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, Queer as Folk, Brokeback Mountain, Capote, more talk shows and reality show fixtures than I would ever care to catalog. But by and large, they were there to be gay. 
That was the point of their presence. Flash forward to now, and we're in a bit more of a happens-to-be-gay counter-narrative period, and it's not hard to understand why. Again, it's mostly gay men who have the most representation, but male gayness was capitalized on to the point of irritation, and something had to shift. And generally, people recognize that removing gay characters would be a regressive step, so the effort now is to downplay that aspect of the characters. But I'm hopeful that soon we'll be ready for the new counter-narrative, where there isn't a definitive right way to represent gay men or any LGBTQ plus character, and we can get a balance between the characters who normalize things and the ones who feel more authentically rooted to the life experience of many members of this community, even though their experiences put them outside of what most mainstream audiences choose to view as normal. So as I said, people tend to say that a character is defined by their queerness as code for they just keep bringing it up. And I'll acknowledge that, yeah, a character having no contextual reason to tie something back to their sexual or gender orientation or identity, but doing so anyways is not exactly what we need. But I would like to see defined by queerness to get re-examined for its possible benefits. I'm going to cite one of my own favorite examples, Batwoman. Now, Batwoman as a character has been around since the 1950s, but the original version was wiped from continuity during Crisis on Infinite Earths. If you don't know what that is, I don't, I don't really have the time to explain. Basically, it, it was an incontinuity reboot. And besides, it's not the original version of the character that I want to talk about here. I'm talking about the character of Kate Kane. She was first introduced in 2006, and she would go on to take the mantle of Batwoman. And she is a character explicitly defined by her gayness. And I'm not saying that because she's had several notable girlfriends and was even engaged during her time in the comics. All that's true, but that's not why she's defined by her gayness. I mean that not only would she be a different person if she wasn't gay, she wouldn't even be Batwoman if she wasn't gay. So for those of you who don't know Kate's backstory, her father was in the military. and She idolized him. She wished for nothing more than to serve for the betterment of those around her in the same way that she saw him do. She enrolled in a military academy, and just shy of her graduation, she was outed as gay by another cadet. Now, this is all taking place during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, where it was no longer permitted to ask a current or prospective person, you know, wanting to be in the service, whether or not they were gay, However, if evidence that they were ever emerged, it was still grounds for dismissal. Kate gets confronted by her instructor who wants to see her move forward. And he says he will disregard the accusation completely, not even look into it any further because all he wants from her is just to say that it isn't true and then he can move on. But because of her belief in the principles she's been training and she refuses to lie and she quits. Sometime later, she would adopt the mantle of Batwoman without seeking the approval of any kind from Batman, for the record, because she felt that the Bat mantle was a calling and one through which she could serve and better her community in a way that she had previously been denied. She wouldn't have become Batwoman if she hadn't dropped out of the military. And she wouldn't have had to drop out of the military if she wasn't gay. Being a lesbian defines this character to her very core. It has shaped who she is, and if she had been written no different from a straight character and just happened to be a lesbian, none of this would be the case. She'd have a completely different reason for becoming Batwoman. Now, more recently, I was very pleasantly surprised to see something similar done very well in the second season of Luke Cage on Netflix. Now, I was not actually a huge fan of this season, but there was a point where two male characters were revealed to have had a sexual relationship in prison when they were there together. This isn't a toss-off line. It's not even really a twist. What it is is a reveal 
that gave audience a deeper understanding of these two characters and gave us better insight and then further informed their actions and their choices in the series. Sadly, characters and relationships like this are the exception, especially in mainstream media, but I feel that this kind of approach, where examining and acknowledging how being LGBTQ plus has brought a character to where they are and how they live and why they make the choices that they do without having acting gay be their purpose for existing, is what should be striven for. Most often when I talk about these topics, there ends up being one or two writers or aspiring writers who reach out to me either in comments or, in, or by email seeking for guidance on how to do LGBTQ plus representation right. Now part of my point here is that there shouldn't be any single way to do it right because that would assume that all LGBTQ plus people and experiences can be represented with a single approach and that's, that's just stupid. However, for anyone seeking an example of doing this well, I encourage you to pick up a copy of Batwoman Elegy. It's available in trade. And this isn't a strict template that everyone must use, but it's a guide for playing out how sexuality or gender identity truly informs a character. Instead of being a throwaway detail, no more important than the color of their eyes. And that's where I would like to see things get. Because ultimately, that's the mark of any well-written character. Not just LGBTQ plus characters, any well-developed, well-written character. What that means is you have looked at who they are, their defining experiences, their defining traits, and looked at how that informs them as a character, the way they behave, the way they act and then played out across the story accordingly. I think where we get into trouble, and, and this is kind of where the happen to be gay thing comes in, I think where we get into trouble is when writers just write a bunch of basically blank slates. I don't think you see it as much with main characters, but I think a lot of time with supporting characters, writers end up writing a whole bunch of blank slates. They write their story and then they go, oh, okay, let's see. I'll make that one a woman and that one will be black. That one's gay. That one's got a kid. That one's divorced. You know, they're, they start stamping traits onto them after the fact. And when you do that, these traits that you've given them don't inform the character. They're just trivia. So in a way, happens to be a gay is kind of true. You should write a gay, queer, bisexual, transgender character the same way you would write any character, but the way that people tend to use it is wrong. Because people use it by meaning write just a generic character and stamp a trait on them so that the trait doesn't distract. But that's, that's a shallow character. Like by design, that's a shallow character. The way you write a deep character is by looking at the traits you've given them and going, okay, how does having this in their background, this is part of their experience, this is part of their character makeup, how does that impact the story I'm telling? And maybe it impacts it a little, maybe it impacts a lot, maybe depending on the nature of the character, maybe it doesn't impact it at all. But that's the level of attention that needs to be paid for LGBTQ plus characters to be fully formed, for any character to be fully formed. That is what should be happening. Because otherwise you've just written a bunch of blank slates. You've just, you've, I mean, to make a video game comparison, you've built one character model and just changed the skin. And that's boring and uninteresting and kind of lazy. I mean, it's not easy. It's work. Doing anything well is more work. You know, writing a good story is work. Writing in good characters is work. Taking into account the representation you're putting out, out into the world, into your creative projects is work and it's exhausting and my uh my heart goes out to anyone who makes the effort to do it so those are my thoughts on 
LGBTQ representation and sort of the finding the balance between happens to be gay, like could have been straight and you wouldn't you wouldn't tell much difference, or you know defined by gayness, which is often used in a derogatory fashion. I don't think it has to be if you apply it right, but it's definitely like I. I can't go back and watch a lot of that stuff from the 2000s. I didn't even like it at the time. But what are your thoughts on all this? Whatever they are, drop something down in the comments, be respectful, and let's talk about it. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do. There's like, there's buttons and there's like links down in the description, including one to my Patreon. So check those out if um, you want to find out more about what I do, other ways to follow me, ways to support me, etc. So um, that's it for this one, folks. Remember, you are the council. I just run the meetings. And until next time, this council has adjourned.